Finally, let's look at uh, the other two trigeminal nuclei, one which we've already spoken of and one which we have not. We made the point about the location of the spinal trigeminal nucleus and its functional significance. As we said, it begins at the entry point of the fifth nerve in the upper pons and extends all the way down to cervical spinal cord. Its neurons are responding to just pain and temperature modalities carried into it by fibers of the trigeminal nerve on a corresponding side. Last but not least is the mesencephalic nucleus of five. This nucleus, as the name implies, is only found in the rostral pons and extends up into the midbrain, and its neurons are responding to just proprioceptive input generated mainly from muscle stretch receptors in muscles of mastication. And its major claim to fame is that these proprioceptive neurons participate in a monosynaptic muscle stretch reflex that's known as the jaw jerk reflex, whereby tapping on the chin of a patient will stretch muscles of mastication, stimulate the the proprioceptive neurons, and there will be a reflex contraction of muscles of mastication bilaterally under normal circumstances. Let's now look at the details regarding the distribution of the divisions of cranial nerve 5, as well as review how the brainstem processes trigeminal sensory information and the lesions associated with various parts of it. As you can see on this figure, the boundaries that are served by the individual divisions of five, ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular, are very precise. The ophthalmic division you can see is serving skin, innervating skin of the forehead scalp, the surface of the cornea, sensory limb of the blink reflex, and the dorsum of the nose. Maxillary division, skin basically in this view over the maxilla, Mandibular division, skin covering the mandible, as well as skin of the anterior wall of the external auditory meatus, and most of the external surface of the tympanic membrane. The other feature that's illustrated on this picture, indicated by numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4, and the dotted and dashed lines, they represent an onion skin configuration about, of how the neurons in the spinal nucleus of five inside the brainstem respond topographically to pain and temperature sensations from different parts of the face, beginning in the area around the lips at number one and moving progressively posteriorly and laterally serving skin for just pain and temperature around the eyes and then moving back, obviously, in the territories serving the anterior wall of the, of the ear and the forehead. Now, let's take this one step further by looking at an overall view of the brainstem, and laid out across this view of the brainstem are the various trigeminal nuclei along with the trigeminal nerve fibers themselves. We've already discussed the trigeminal nerve, and we know that its axons either enter or exit from a uh, position in the rostral pons. And we've already pointed out, but reviewing again now, that there are two nuclei right at the exit or entry point of the trigeminal nerve and they are the lower motor neurons in the motor nucleus of five and the sensory neurons responding to tactile modalities in the main sensory nucleus of five. Extending below the entry point of the fifth nerve is the elongate spinal trigeminal nucleus that contains second neurons that respond to pain and temperature sensations and these neurons have the onion skin topographic representation as replicated by the numbers over on the left side of this diagram. And then extending above the entry point of the fifth nerve is the mesencephalic nucleus, which we know contains proprioceptive fibers, mainly from muscles of mastication. So let's deal with the trigeminal nerve components individually, starting with the lower motor neurons. They're very straightforward because the lower motor neuron cell bodies of the fifth nerve are right at the exit point of the nerve. And as we well know, the motor fiber axons exit with the trigeminal nerve, course with the mandibular division of five, and innervate muscles of mastication. Next point we want to make is, how does, how does the trigeminal system process its various sensory components? And the answer is, it processes sensory information just like our body somatosensory systems processed body wall sensations of the same kind, by utilizing three neurons beginning at their sensory receptor and ending at conscious levels of somatosensory cortex. And again, like our body wall sensations, 
the axons of the second neuron in, this, in these trigeminal pathways crosses the midline in the vicinity of its cell body. So let's see how this, this works. Starting with a tactile afferent neuron that you see here, again, the cell body of that neuron is outside the CNS, in this case in the trigeminal ganglion, as represented by the little lollipop structure that's uh, at the tip of the arrow. The central process of that touch neuron enters in the trigeminal nerve and synapses with second neurons in the main sensory nucleus of five. Their axons cross in the vicinity of their cell body, and then they project up to the contralateral thalamus to neuron number three, which then projects to somatosensory cortex. Note the thalamic nucleus that is receptive to trigeminal sensations. It is the VPM nucleus in the thalamus, ventral, postural, medial. The more interesting pathway is the one that's utilized for pain and temperature sensations. Pain and temperature, neuron number one, like the touch afferents, have their cell bodies in the trigeminal ganglion, but here's the difference. The central processes of that first neuron enter with the trigeminal nerve, but they then turn and extend downward through the length of the, of the pons into the medulla to synapse on the pain and temperature receptive neurons that are laid out in the elongate spinal nucleus of five. So really, the spinal tract of five really represents just the incoming pain and temperature nerve fibers that are carried in by the trigeminal nerve. But following the rule, the axons of the second neurons in that spinal trigeminal nucleus cross in the vicinity of their cell body and ascend up to the thalamus, uh, basically joining up with the tactile afferents above the level of the entry point of the fifth nerve. So here's the differential. Be sensitive about a patient that has a complete trigeminal nerve lesion versus one that may just have a brainstem lesion that affects only the spinal trigeminal nucleus of five. As we discussed earlier, if a patient has a complete lesion of the trigeminal nerve right at the entry or exit point of the nerve in the rostral pons, that patient is going to have a complete anesthesia of the ipsilateral side of the face and jaw weakness, whereas a patient that just has a lateral and caudal pons lesion or a lateral medullary lesion, that lesion will only affect the spinal nucleus of five and the only trigeminal nerve sign the patient will present with will be just an ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature sensations, tactile sensations, and muscles of mastication function will be intact. The next thing that we need to talk about with regard to brainstem anatomy is how do lower motor neurons in cranial nerves receive their upper motor neuron innervation? Because like spinal nerve lower motor neurons, cranial nerve motor ner lower motor neurons have to be driven by a cortical drive. And the name of these upper motor neurons that serve cranial nerve lower motor neurons are known either as corticobulbar or corticonuclear fibers. And certainly their job is to serve the cranial nerves such as 5, 7, 9, 10, 11, and 12 that are innervating various populations of skeletal muscles. Muscles of mastication for five, facial expression for seven, palate, pharynx, larynx for mainly 10, a little bit of nine, uh, hypoglossal nerve for the tongue, and obviously the two muscles innervated by the spinal accessory nerve. But here's the interesting feature about how corticobulbar innervation differs from corticospinal innerv innervation. And this is illustrated on the next slide. Note here, as we talked about at spinal cord anatomy, that lower motor neurons in spinal nerves are almost exclusively getting a contralateral upper motor neuron innervation, contralateral corticospinal innervation, as illustrated on this picture. But note the difference in cranial nerve lower motor neurons. Instead of getting a contralateral upper motor neuron innervation, they're predominantly getting a bilateral corticobulbar drive. So as indicated on the picture, each lower motor neuron in a cranial nerve is being driven simultaneously by an upper motor neuron that has a cell body either in the right motor cortex or the left motor cortex. But of course, there's an exception. The exception to this bilaterality is illustrated in the, in the picture on the next page where it turns out that only some of the lower motor neurons in the facial nerve 
are receiving a bilateral corticobulbar innervation. And you can see in the illustration here which ones those are. First off, what's shown on here on the right side of the figure is what happens when muscles of facial expression contract. So on the right side, you're seeing all of the muscles of facial expression that would be innervated by the right facial nerve. And when those muscles contract, they wrinkle the forehead, shut the eye, flare the nostril, and obviously change the position of the lips, smiling, frowning, pursing them, what have you. What's illustrated on the left side is the facial motor nucleus, which we know is in the pons, and obviously we're seeing the distribution on the left of various facial motor axons, either going to forehead and eye muscles and or nose and mouth muscles. But here's the point of the picture. Note that only the lower motor neurons in the facial nerve that are innervating muscles of the forehead and eye are getting a bilateral corticobulbar innervation. In contrast, the lower motor neurons that serve muscles of the nose and mouth are only receiving a contralateral corticobulbar innervation. So again, be sensitive. If you're presented with a patient that has a weakness in the ability to wrinkle the forehead, can't shut their eye, can't flare their nostril and and the corner of the mouth droops, that lesion is most likely in the facial nerve as indicated by lesion B in this particular illustration. But if a patient presents with facial weakness, and if the weakness is only limited to the lower face, meaning that the patient can still wrinkle their forehead and shut both eyes bilaterally in the blink reflex, that lesion is most likely not in the facial nerve, but it is in the corticobulbar fibers above the facial motor nucleus, either in the midbrain, internal capsule, or even in areas of motor cortex. And that's the point made by a lesion at A. Lesion at A, in this example where we are destroying all of the corticobulbar axons coming out of the right hemisphere, would not really have any effect on any other population of cranial nerve lower motor neurons other than those that are serving the lower face muscles. So a complete lesion at A would result in a contralateral or left side lower face weakness. So again, you need to be sensitive about the differential based on the extent of facial facial weakness and where a proposed lesion might be.